Oof. What's going on everybody, DJ Valentine here right about now. I have to admit, up until recently, I hadn't played Sonic Adventure 2 for over a decade. Yeah, it's true. Sadly, the game introduced a bunch of things that I wasn't too keen on, and that is probably why I didn't play it for ages. It doesn't mean I hate it though, but it does mean I'm very, very selective regarding the things that I do like about it. Like for example, I'm not a big fan of grind rails, I, I kinda hate them, I hate the grinding. And this was the game that introduced the grinding mechanics, so... You can see where I'll be going with that if I continued my point. But, as I said, there are things about Sonic Adventure 2 that I genuinely appreciate. And this top 5 video series is aimed at spending more time talking about the things I like, rather than the things that I don't like. I just thought I'd better get a warning out in the open first. It's very highly likely that due to my stance on this game, I'm probably going to have a completely different list to you guys. So, you know, be nice, yeah? Play nice, bro. play nice. Before we get into it, I'm going to send a very big shout out to Delta Max for backing me on Patreon, as well as voting for this episode to be made in the first place. I greatly appreciate your support, thank you for being here, and hopefully I will not upset you or any of the other patrons with this list. Oh, uh, also, if you want to join Delta Max in supporting me, then please check out my Patreon page. Links are in the video description, and all help is appreciated. Safe. Alright then, here we go. Here we bloody go. Here's a top 5 levels from Sonic Adventure 2 video that doesn't feature City Escape, and in fact, only has one Sonic level in the whole list. Eh? One Sonic level in the whole list, and here it is, here it is right now, right out of the bloody gates, rolling around at the speed of sound, it's... Um... Metal Harbor. I'm more surprised than you are. I really am. The only Sonic level featured in this list is Metal Harbor, and I think it mostly boils down to the fact that out of all the Sonic levels, this is the only one that plays smoothly for me. All the other Sonic levels have one issue or another where I feel something is kinda off, or something doesn't appeal to my personal tastes. When I made this shocking revelation that I was about to do a top 5 Sonic levels video, and somehow only feature one Sonic level, that of which was some short blink and you'll miss it stage that most people tend to sidestep in favour of City Escape or Green Forest, I froze. I began fearing for my life. I couldn't do a Sonic list video and the only Sonic level to make the list was Metal Bloody Harbour, but here we are. Me at my most vulnerable, this is me. I still bruise easily by the way. Natasha Bedingfield, big tune, why haven't you listened to it yet? Look, alright, I like playing through Metal Harbor. It has a really decent flow to it, and when the button inputs work properly, I'm having a great time. I can zip all around this level with ease and be treated to some high speed sections that make me feel a rush. There's a few tall points that immediately flow into low dips which connect super well with each other, giving off this roller coaster vibe. You get a great amount of momentum in this stage without anything stopping you or ruining your flow. I personally feel it progresses the best out of all the other Sonic stages in this game, but again, that's just me, innit? Visually, okay, there's not much to look at here. It's just some conveniently placed runways out in the middle of the ocean, where the military keeps all their missiles and aircraft carriers. It's the sunny day blue skies aesthetic, and that looks nice, but aside from that, there isn't much else to look at. The giant missile launch towards the end of the stage was also a very memorable set piece. I do kind of wish there was more to this part rather than just running up some narrow ramps, but it's not a big deal. Despite the fact that you can clear this section without too much trouble, every time that countdown sequence starts, I always feel a twinge of nervousness build up inside me, and I suppose that's the whole point. So well done. Meteor Herd In my last video I said that I like Knuckles' exploration levels a lot, and Sonic Adventure 2 really opened out the field for him. Granted, they gimped his radar mechanics, so now you have to find pieces of the Master Emerald in a set order, rather than just going off on your merry way, but aside from that small setback, the amount of area you can cover as Knuckles is astounding. Meteor Herd, being Knuckles' last level in the game, pulls out all the stops. During the story, the Space Colony Arc sheds a layer of its shell to reveal a huge cannon. The discarded layers remain floating around the Arc, and it's on this layer that the level takes place. Set within the meteorite belt, this stage has you traversing higher and higher towards the arc colony that hangs above your head. If you continue travelling to the top, you can even reach the underside of the colony. It's bloody impressive when you're heading upwards and you see this giant satellite just looming over you. It's so daunting, and I love it. Furthermore, unlike some other Knuckles levels that tend to have a leisurely approach to them, Meteor Herd keeps you on your toes. Since the stage takes place within a meteor belt, smaller meteorites are still being flung around. Stand still for too long and you're gonna catch a meteor to the face, so you need to keep moving. 
I just love exploring this level. I love how high it goes. Grabbing a rocket and firing yourself all the way to the highest section gives you a real sense of just how big this stage is. Sometimes I'll glide around for ages just appreciating the scope of it all. And hang, hang on a second, hang on a second. Can, can you hear that? Now, listen, 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 listen to that. Can you hear that, yeah? It, is that... Is that UK garage music? Am I listening to... Am I listening to... Have Sega put UK garage music into a Sonic game? This reason alone guaranteed Meteor Herd was going to make the list. In the UK during the late 90s and early 2000s, pirate radio stations were huge and a lot of them were playing garage music like this. Pirate radio stations were practically a culture over here and a culture which I took part in myself. The underground scene was filled with MCs spitting bars and singers harmonising over bubbling bass lines and swinging drums. It's such a unique and iconic sound from my region of the world and I love it so much. It was a crucial style of music to my childhood but because of its underground nature, UKG wasn't well known worldwide. I mean nowadays countries like America are exploring the garage music style because music in general has become so open thanks to the internet. But back then during that time? To hear UKG come from anything but a British station was unheard of. So you can imagine my absolute surprise when on a summer's day during 2001, a young teenage Digi Valentine reaches Meteor Hurt for the very first time and that type of drum loop hits my ears. I bloody lost it. I couldn't believe UK Garage had made it into a Sonic game. Technically speaking, Death Chamber, which is a Knuckles level that appears before Meteor Herd, also utilises the UK Garage sound for its theme song too. I'm not even sure how I overlooked it at the time. I think I just wasn't paying attention to Death Chamber in general because I didn't notice its theme song at all when I first played it. But Meteor Herd grabbed my attention from the jump off. That initial record scratch, the hi-hats kicking in to accompany the synth while the bass just bobbles in that familiar UKG fashion. There was no way I was going to miss that. That was UKG. That was the music of my people fam. And it was in a video game where a red echidna runs around looking for shiny jewels in space. I have no idea how this happened, but it did. And I loved Sega for it. Pumpkin Hill. For all the love that I give Meteor Herd though, I have to agree with one of the main negative responses it gets. The stage can be a bit too big, and if you're trying to finish it quickly, the last thing you want to do is travel a million miles upwards to find one Emerald Shard, only to travel a million miles back down to find the other one. I get it, it's a big level and some of us don't have the time to sightsee. Fair point. This is where Pumpkin Hill comes in, and why it just slightly beats out Meteor Herd on this list, if only by an inch. Pumpkin Hill does everything Meteor Herd does, only more intelligently. It's easier to reach different sections of the level without needing to do some specific requirements first. No need to jump to various platforms just to use some rocket pad in an effort to reach the higher part of the level. Each section of Pumpkin Hill connects together conveniently so that if you need to get on the other side of the mountain, you can just climb your way over or glide for a few seconds to reach the part you need to explore on. There's nothing stopping you from getting around, it's completely open. This is still a huge level with tons of places to explore, but it's saving graces it doesn't require you to use inconvenient time consuming routes to get from one place to the next. You need to get to one part of the level, boom, you're there in no time, sorted. And what about the level itself? In my last video I mentioned how Red Mountain with Knuckles felt almost like a prototype of what Pumpkin Hill would eventually become and it truly is an evolution of that layout. Towering hills dominate the land, allowing Knuckles to climb up high and get a better view of the level. Hazards roam around more commonly on the lower parts, so gliding between locations gives you a better chance to scope out what's down there and plan your approach accordingly. I love the visual theme of this stage too, the whole spooky Halloween vibe thing. Pumpkin-shaped hills litter the outer skirts facing inwards, almost like they're watching you as you explore the level. I love how each section has its own story to tell as well, featuring gravestones in interesting layouts, or pumpkins with different facial expressions carved onto them. It feels like the level is trying to reward you for taking your time and looking around. And of course, it goes without saying, but yeah, the theme song is also another reason why Pumpkin Hill makes this list. I ain't gonna let it get to me, I'm just gonna creep. Down in Pumpkin Hill, I got to find my lost piece. I know that it's here, I can sense it in my feet. The great emerald's power allows me to feel. I can't 
can't see a thing, but it's around somewhere. I'm gonna hold my head because I have no fear. While I do have more of a personal connection to Meteor Herd's theme, the song for Pumpkin Hill is one of those timeless classics. People continuously bring it up over and over again. It might even be one of Knuckles' most memorable tunes. Lines from it get quoted more than any other song. The song also has the added bonus of being considered a seasonal tune since it's connected to Halloween. And anytime Halloween comes around, you just know someone, somewhere is blasting this tune. Like, you can bet your money on it, sir. Radical Highway of all the high speed levels that I remembered from Sonic Adventure 2, Radical Highway always stood at the forefront. It was the level that I played the most when I was a kid. It's no surprise that Shadow has some of the best early stages in the entire game. I mean, Sonic Team were out here trying to show off the new character. Radical Highway lets Shadow go to work as a speedster character while giving him a few neatly placed tricks to pull off. It's designed to keep you moving forward at high speeds via long straights and multiple loops. Any platforming that comes into play is short but smooth, slowing you down to deal with the hazard but not cancelling your momentum entirely. I used to get this fantastic rush from pulling off a couple of quick tricks in succession and then gunning it down a steep roadway. I felt like a bloody badass. And that's what you want your players to feel like on the opening stage of a brand new character that you've just introduced. I think it's safe to say that they nailed it with Radical Highway since it kept me coming back to it. The song is also pretty damn solid, thumping away with that pulsating kick and bass line. It's not as fun or adventurous as Speed Highway's song from Sonic Adventure 1, but then again, you're not aiming for that sort of atmosphere. Shadow is being portrayed as an anti-hero, and at this point in the story, he's technically a criminal. You won't have funky Red Hot Chili Pepper style bass lines blasting out over this level. It's going to be something a little darker, a little harder, and a little edgier. And there, I said the word edge, I said it, yeah? Pay me. Naturally, the other element to this level that kept someone like me coming back was the fact that it took place within the city. I just love my cityscapes and this one fits the bill nicely. Though, granted, you spend more time on bridges and motorways than you do running alongside the buildings themselves, but any buildings that do make an appearance shine brightly and litter the surrounding area with vibrant colours. In fact, there's one particular building in this level that I'd like to point out quickly. And that's the Knight's Resort Hotel that Shadow runs past at one brief point towards the end of the stage. Alright, come on, you should know me by now. I love my nights into dreams, so you probably already saw this coming. I just find it funny that Sonic Team took my love for glistening nighttime cityscapes and then took one of my favourite video game IPs of all time and mashed them both together for me like this. It's like, thanks guys, you're wicked, I appreciate it. Seriously, I think this might actually be one of my favourite nights cameos of the lot. Huh, maybe I should do a top 5 nights cameos video at some point. I'd better write that down. Anyways, yeah, Radical Highway takes second place because although I used to play through it a whole bunch back in the day, recently I've come to appreciate another level even more. White Jungle Alright, before you say anything, yeah? Like, before you say a goddamn thing, yes, it's because it's green. It's a green level. The colour green is being used. It's because I love the colour green. Yes, we know, I should put that slogan on a t-shirt and wear it by this point. It's because it's bloody green. But no, for real. Aside from the fact that this level takes place in a rainforest, therefore its colour palette is mostly green by design and I love it very much for that, there are other things to White Jungle which I appreciate a lot. Firstly, let's just get this out of the way and say the song is bloody awesome. Like, my god, seriously. I think I loved the tune before I ever grew to love the level itself. The energy of the drums in this tune is so erratic and savage, in part due to the usage of a particular sample. Two words. Amen break. Another two words. Jungle music. No, not music made in a literal jungle. I mean, the genre that was, again, like UK Garage, a style of music birthed in the UK. An early 90s creation, Jungle would later evolve into the style you know today as drum and bass. One of the key defining traits for Jungle music was the use of something called the Amen Break. I won't go into it now because this is not a music class, but I'll link to a video that'll bring you right up to speed. It's incredibly eye-opening, so go watch it when you have a second. But yeah, here we are in a level called White Jungle with a UK jungle drum loop playing in the background. Granted, this song also has elements of other genres in there, such as industrial and techno, but that chopped and spliced drum pattern is straight up jungle. Make no mistake. But anyways, back to the level itself. So, we got a sick tune, we got some green shit all over the place that makes me happy. 
What else is it about White Jungle that grants it the number one spot? Well, the fact that it plays superbly is another reason. I can pick up insane speeds thanks to long downward straights, there are some really cool moments when the path angles out to the side and you're just gunning through it like some hedgehog shaped bobsleigh. And can we talk about the camera angles yeah, I don't think I mentioned them enough in these videos but there's an art form to framing a good shot and White Jungle has a particular camera angle that I especially love. It comes into use when you hit the loops on this stage, the way it just sits underneath and lets shadow go overhead before panning back around behind him. It's so fluid and smooth and you maintain a wonderful sense of speed because of it and thanks to that kicking jungle drum loop, this perfectly framed shot doesn't lose the energy of what's happening at all. I also appreciate how the vine sections keep the momentum up as they swing you around the giant trees before slingshotting you off towards the next platform. On the GameCube and PC versions, rain was added to the stage which I feel is a nice visual aesthetic that complements the darker mood of Shadow and the song that's playing. This level just combines all its elements together and gives me one amazing sprint through the jungle. It doesn't hinder me or try to stop me from moving forward and anytime it does throw obstacles in my way, I have the tools within Shadow's skill set to blast through them and keep the momentum going, providing the game doesn't eat its own face for a second and bug out when I try to do a homing attack. To be honest, I feel I need to give a little sideways shout out to Green Forest, which is Sonic's version of this same level. They play somewhat similarly, though there were a few platforming moments in Sonic's version that I'm not too keen on, but I think that perhaps if White Jungle wasn't on this list, I might have included Green Forest somewhere instead, so take that for what you will. Overall though, White Jungle just does more for me as a complete package of a level and that's why I'm giving it my number one spot. So yeah man, that was my list of favourite Sonic Adventure 2 levels. Wasn't that interesting? See, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't. We got through it. We got through it together, didn't we? We're still here. You still like me. We're still friends. I guess. Anyways, I have two honourable mentions and you're probably going to hate them because they're still not Sonic levels. Though I guess we can consider the Green Forest shout out I just did as a semi-honourable mention then. But yeah, whatever anyway. First honourable mention goes out to um, Aquatic Mine. The level itself isn't that great to look at. In all honesty, the level does absolutely nothing for me aesthetically. I think the only thing I like about it are the blue flames that litter some of the sections, but for a water-based level this could have been so much more interesting than some dank pit. The reason it's getting an honourable mention is mostly down to the music, because it's one of my favourite Knuckles songs from the game. More so than Pumpkin Hill, but less so than Meteor Heard. It's somewhere in between, I guess. But anyways, yeah, Aquatic Mine gets an honourable mention. The second honourable mention goes out to Dry Lagoon, a rouge level. I love the visual design for this stage. The whole Oasis vibe is so welcoming for an opening level to a character. Yes, there's green shit all over the place, so of course I'm feeling attracted to its beautiful colour palette, but there's other things going on in here that I really love, like the butterflies for example, offering the stage tiny little bursts of vibrant colours, or the turquoise tones of the water which look inviting and refreshing. I think the reason Dry Lagoon didn't make it onto the main list though, is because I already had put two Knuckles exploration levels in, and I needed space for the other stages. And when it came down to making the cut on either Dry Lagoon or Metal Harbor, I chose Dry Lagoon because if I'd done this list without a single Sonic level anywhere in the top 5, I'd probably have to shut my channel down quite frankly, it would be over. It would be all done, finished. Uh, so um, shout outs to Dry Lagoon for taking one for the team. Big up Rouge. But uh, anyway, yeah, I'm gonna duck out now and this will be the last top 5 video for the year. I'll see about bringing it back and doing some other variations of top 5 lists when 2020 rolls in. Uh, if you like this video though, please can I kindly ask you guys to throw me a like and share it around. Like seriously, YouTube's algorithm is killing me here. It's gotten so bad, I'm trying to push videos out. I have a feeling half my subs ain't seen my videos in their feeds because when I was on that hiatus, it kind of deaded my channel and uh, it's been tough trying to come back from that. So all help is really appreciated. Likes, comments, shares, all that stuff is super appreciated. And uh, not just on this video, but any video I do, the support is crucial right about now. And uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, once again, a big shout out to all my people backing me on Patreon. These VIPs are keeping the show running on a financial level, so a huge thanks must go out to them. And if you want to play your part and help out too, please consider checking my Patreon page. The links are in the video description and all help is appreciated. Before I go, if you're on Twitter and Instagram, then so am I. You can find me over there if you're into that sort of thing too. And uh, yeah, I've been Digi Valentine. Thanks for your time. Take care and I'll see you all again real soon. And yo, if they don't know about me, let them know safe. <laughs>